if I have pictures of Montaza or not. Um, but but you can find them on the internet easily. If you like, I, I can I, I can I can give you. Absolutely, uh, you yeah. you went to you you were a member of that club. Oh, it was you it was have it was, it, fan it, it was fantastic. Now, um, so in, in Alexandria was was great. My sister went to study there, and and she stayed with her grandmother on her father's side, and eventually she met uh, somebody, her cousin, who she got married to. Her cousin from her, her father's, father's side. side. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and so so they, they got married, and so. Um, uh, she would get married at 18, and they eventually left for Switzerland, and, and they went directly. Her, her husband was in the cotton business, and he, his father died at, when he was 16, and he was brilliant. He was able to take over, to learn the business, and make a success of it, and transfer it to Switzerland. So it was a very interesting transition for them. Uh, back to back to to, to Cairo. Uh, during our winters um, and spring and fall, we were members of a club called the Gazira Sporting Club, which is still around. It was a British club, to which they were where they allowed just a few Jews, and um, a few members of the international community. But it was built for the Brits by the Brits. Just to give you an idea of what it was, it was. And we felt it, and we, we appreciate every minute we were there. Example, the club had 30 tennis courts, 20 squash courts, 7 swimming pools, croquet, cricket, bowl, long bowling, horseback riding, 9-hole golf course, um, hairdresser, uh, library, which I loved. They had a with all the newest magazines and Reuter ticker tape coming in all day long. Um, the restaurants, uh, beautiful restaurants, uh, and, and the women would go, go there and play cards in the afternoon. But I, I, I knew people who were there. What did they play? They played bridge a lot. Um, it was, bridge seemed to be the thing. And, uh, and so I, I knew people who would go to, uh, to the club at 7 o'clock in the morning and not leave till 7 or 8 or 9 o'clock at night because there was so much to do all day long. If they would change activity every two hours, they would be doing something different. They would play tennis early in the morning, then they would have breakfast, then they would go swimming, then they would, do, they, they would take a nap, there were areas where you could take a nap, then they would have lunch, then they would go horseback riding, then they would go... You, it was just, how did these people earn a living? Very simple. They owned land, they had uh, a crop, a cr a crop shares, and they basically shared the, 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 the profits or, or, or parts of the profits with, with the guys who, who, who planted uh, things on their land, and that was it. Or they had a factory, they had a manager for the factory, and, the, the, and, and, and they, they, their biggest concern was how well did I play tennis today? The factory ran by itself. There wasn't that much competition, simply because if you came up with one idea, uh, or if you came up with one uh, uh, product that was needed in, 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 in Egypt, you had it made. Also, they would export all over, all over the Middle East. These countries didn't have. So, in Egypt, they made. They made shirts, and they made underwear, and they made, they made you name it, they made it. They, they, food products. So, uh, matter of fact, one of the things that my parents used to love doing was taking us visiting factories. We would go visit uh, farm, farms that would be, had turned into factories. I saw uh, homogenized milk for the first time in bottles. We used to get our milk from huge jars that came from the farm. And they would boil it and so on. And for the first time in Alexandria, I saw a factory making milk in jars. <laughs> and so to me, it was like, whoa, look at that. And then they took us to visit uh, uh, the different, different places where they, were, they would have uh, 
mango, mango jams, and they would do all kinds of things, jams and so on, uh, that they would export. So you had, uh, there was a certain activity that was quite, quite, uh, quite amazing. Um, that was my world. Beautiful world. It was interesting. It was, it was bittersweet because, let me give you the bitter side. You have to. Yeah. Uh, the bitter side was that for that, all that beauty, there was a price to pay. My mother paid the price because she, uh, she had her husband who died very young and, uh, and she got sick also. Uh, matter of fact, she died a year after we arrived in Canada. Yeah. And uh, that was very difficult. Uh, I was only 14 at the time, my brother was only 8. So it was really, it was a, uh, we went through a very hard time when we came to Canada. It wasn't like sweet. Would you like to know a little bit about how we left Egypt? Or? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But first, oh, so you left. Let Egypt. me tell you about the bitter side of Egypt yes. before we before we. Yes, before definitely. We I'll, I'll, anyway, I'll get to that. Okay. Anyway. okay. Yes. The the bitter part was was like that. I grew up in the word stress was daily and constant. I don't think we were ever able to really relax. My parents were, had a very positive attitude and, and very, uh, they were outgoing and they were very sociable and the whole bit. My father knew how to relax and my father knew how to take, uh, and my mother too, but, but um, they knew how to take life uh, in a positive way. But when I was young, I was faced with a huge amount of pressure and a huge amount of stress coming from school to begin with, because, and from outside, I was never considered in. I was always considered out. I was always considered not Egyptian. When I came to Canada, the first thing that Canadians did was they embraced us. They made us feel welcome. And, and, and so, uh, French Canadians, I spoke to them, it was in French. Uh, Jews, I spoke to them, it was in English. Uh, Italians, uh, the few words of Italian, uh, you know, I relate to everybody. Because I had different parts of the family who were from different areas, uh, uh, and, and so Canada brought it together. However, in Egypt, although it was very cosmopolitan and very worldly, uh, and, and very, in certain ways, more elegant than it was here, uh, absolutely. Just to give you an idea of, of elegance, before I get to the bitter part, uh, my, 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 I went to uh, the opera for once in, in Egypt. It was my grand uncle, my, my, my mother's uncle, who's a car dealer, the, the Dutch. Uh, uh, he invited us to go, see, uh, to go see La Traviata, Verdi's La Traviata, at the opera house in Egypt. And the opera house in Egypt was, it, it burned down, unfortunately. It was magnificent. It was typical of all the opera houses you see in, in Europe, it, it, whether it's Vienna or France or whatever. It was all gold and all, all velvet, red, red, like the red velvet chairs here and so on, exactly like that. Well, matter of fact, identical to this chair, except with gold trimming, we had a loge. And, 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 the loge was the best seats of the house. You were facing the, facing the stage, and it was, uh, it was semicircular. And then uh, we sat on chairs like that, not on all the other chairs. We could stretch out and do. And, and at intermission, they came in and they served us orange juice and whatever we wanted to drink. And so uh, I sat there completely mesmerized, number one, with the music. And I had a huge musical retention. I could re retain music very easily. And I could literally the next day hum just about half a dozen of those tunes. We, having heard them once, it was enough. And, and, but the whole experience to me was so magnificent. And, and I was accustomed to, to, to that sort of thing because my friends lived in embassies and lived in, and their parents were wealthy and they had surroundings like this and so to me it was normal, you know, you went over to a friend's house and it was magnificent, so, you know, <laughs> that was it, taken for granted. And they had staff, sure, they had at least two, three staff, you know. Well, my father 
built a building in Egypt uh, uh, as an investment with his father-in-law. And, and, and I'm getting to the stress part because it's coming. And, and so, um, uh, he, because he came to Canada in 1952. And my mother's side of the family was already here. And he picked the wrong time. He came in February in 1952. The first thing he did was catch a cold. My aunt and uncle, Pardo, who were living in Upper Westmount at the time, Eve's parents, uh, he stayed with them, and and it was it was uh, it, it was quite an experience because he took movies and he showed them to us in Egypt, and he said, "This is how he told my mother, this is how your brother and sister-in-law live." And here was mountains of snow. My aunt huddled in fur coats, and, and, and we were sitting in Cairo in our, on our veranda, watching the, the movies outdoors in our own building. We lived in the penthouse in the building. So we, had, you know, we were watching the movies, and uh, I ran to the fridge, and I opened up the freezer, and I said, am I going to live in there one day? This is impossible. I mean, how can people live that way? So. We did. <laughs> but so my father came back to Cairo and he said to my, my mother, you know, let's not rush. <laughs> let's, although there were all kinds of pressures that were going on, political pressures and so on, since, since, Egypt, uh, since Israel was, was born, we, had, we started to feel the pressure immediately in 1948. Matter of fact, my uncle Pardo, Eve's, Eve's father, Joseph Pardo, um, was put into an internment camp. Absolutely. Most people don't know. We had concentration camps in Egypt. Definitely. We had concentration camps uh, that were was, that was set up uh, as a result of when, when Israel was formed. And, and, and they, and so they, it wasn't during the World War II? Uh, it no, it was, uh, it was when Israel was formed. And, 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 and uh, they decided that that no, they didn't want Israel to be formed. And they went looking for, for my uncle, who was a member of the Jewish Y. There was a Jewish Y at the time, just like set up in, like in Montreal. There was a Jewish this, the Jewish that, the Jewish the other, you name it. This, the Jewish community was fabulously set up. But as I grew up, it started to fall apart. So uh, that was the bitter part. But, but they went looking for him, and they didn't find my uncle. They took his brother, which is Joseph Pardo. The other one was the younger brother, who was in the States at the time. Or in Europe, I don't remember, but he, he was not in the country. So they took his brother instead. They put him in a concentration camp. Fortunately, my, 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 uh, my uncle's uh, father-in-law was a jeweler. And he was one of the top jewelers in Cairo. And, um, and in Egypt, and he had contacts. He got him out of the concentration camp, and they left immediately. And they they went to France for a couple of years. They they then they decided to come to Canada because it was a land of opportunity, and you speak French, and they felt more comfortable in the French-speaking environment. So Montreal to them was was was. Uh, was home. They made home out of it. And as you can see, they lived very well right from the start. They, they, lived in, uh, they had a house in Upper West Mount, and they, so they, they lived, they lived uh, very comfortably. Um, however, when my father came to visit them, he said to them, now how many, how many servants have you got? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the answer. The answer was, we have a cleaning lady, she comes in once a day. And she says, well, how about the rest of the time? So, so they go, well, no, we don't have. You don't have? Oh, I see, OK. And tell me, uh, where's your country club? Uh, do you belong to a country club? Yes, we belong to Elmridge. How nice. How often do you go? Oh, two months of the year. <laughs> two months of the year, uh-huh. And how far is it from here? Well, it's Il Bizarre. Il Bizarre? And he goes, yeah, how far is that? Oh, well, it takes us about an hour to get there. In those days, there were no bridges, you know, those, you have to, to get there. Was a, so he comes back to Egypt and he says, not so fast. We're staying here. 
so uh, until we have to leave. So um, and my and his father-in-law, my mother's father, was also assimilated to, to Egypt. He didn't want to leave. He was very happy there. He had income. He had uh, businesses. He had uh, he was he was and he was he was getting older. So so gradually he needed something to retire on. So him and my father decided we're going to build a building to generate income, and they did. The only problem was that when the building was half built, the Suez Canal crisis took place, mm. and in 1956, 56, 1956, and his father-in-law died. Just after Yom Kippur, two, three days after Yom Kippur, he died. Natural death? Uh, well, in natural death. He was in his early 70s. You know. <laughs> so uh, he was overweight. He had, he had, he had, uh, he had uh, what did he have? Uh, something like cerebral hemorrhage, that, yeah. that kind of But he wasn't killed or. No, he was not killed. No, no. Uh, no member of my family was killed. We were very lucky from that point of view. No, but he died from a lot of stress. It was very difficult, very, very difficult for him. Um, so in the meantime, my father finds himself straddled with a building that's half built, heirs, the children of his father-in-law, who are partners with him now, who are part of them were in Egypt, and the other part were already in North America. And no, it's no, no, uh, no, uh, no estate uh, plan, and no, no will. No will, nothing. So, how do you solve that issue? It took. It really took my father uh, a lot of of courage to, to, to go to, 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 to surmount that. He was able to get. Uh, he had such a good reputation. All the, the suppliers said to him, we'll supply you, don't worry. When the building is built, then you can pay us. He, was, yeah, he had a very good, solid rock reputation. So, and they trusted him. So that's what happened. In the meantime, the tax people said, you owe us. Why? Estate taxes. You're not leaving the country so fast. So, stress. And I felt the stress, and he felt the stress, everybody felt the stress. So, growing up, that was part of the stress. <clears throat> not only did I, was I not felt, uh, not made to feel comfortable by the Egyptians, I was never made to feel Egyptian. I was always talked to like an outsider. Hey, we spoke French and spoke English, and Italian and Spanish. And Arabic? Oh, yeah, a little bit of Arabic, just to the servants. So not much. We're not like the Iraqis who, 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 were, who were, the, the, a, lot, a lot of the Iraqis spoke Arabic at home and all that. And there were Egyptian Jews who did speak Arabic at home. Not many. But my environment was European. I never felt I was Egyptian. I always felt I was European. I always felt at home in Italy, in France, in, in, in Switzerland, in, 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 in England, but never in Egypt. I was, yeah, it, it's very difficult. It's very, very difficult to, to feel like you're an outsider. Now, all the stresses came along with, 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 with that. <clears throat> so they, they, they said to my father, when you pay your taxes, then you can leave. So we already planned our exit. We didn't know when, but half our furniture was packed in crates and, and so on, and was shipped to Canada in the name of, an, of, of, of a printer. It wasn't our name, because we weren't allowed to ship anything, send out anything, right? so it was smuggled out. <laughs> <laughs> then the Egyptians go and get us now for this. But, but, um, but it was, it, my father had contacts, and people loved him, and people respected him, and people would bend over backwards from him, including many Egyptians, who were very helpful. Uh, because were, friendships were extremely solid. They were not, in the Middle East, friendships were like stronger than family. 
It was really, really solid stuff. His loyalty. Very loyalty. The, 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 everywhere. You, you had manservants who were, or, or, who were so loyal they, they'd do anything for you. So, um, uh, eventually the building was built. It was a high-end building. Uh, it was, we had people from the embassies and so on living in our building. So, again, I was surrounded by people from embassies all the time. And so it was really... Now a span of how long? A year? What? The, the building got built or uh, half built? It, it, span took, of how it long? took two years, I would say. Two, three years to build. By the time it got built? And it finished and all that. It took a couple of years. Okay. took a couple of years. And interestingly enough, part of the bidder, we'll get, give you a bit of an idea of, of, of more of the bidder. When I was about 10, um, I, uh, I said to my parents, you know, I'd like to go shopping by myself, big man. I want to go buy bread. And they said, yeah, you know, uh, the, 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 the baker is two, three blocks away. Here's money, go fetch it. But you know, we have staff for that. You don't have to go. Or we'll go together. We have the car, you know, we'll, we'll go. I said, no, I want to walk there. I haven't changed, by the way. I'm still the same. I, I want to walk there, and, and I want to go buy bread. And they said, OK, do you know what to buy? Yes, I know what to buy. <laughs> it was pretty, pretty. And they were very liberal. They allowed me to do things I would never allow my kids to do. Never. I was allowed to go downtown by myself at 10 years old. I went to learn typing at 10 years old. Oh, my parents said, these, when my father came from Canada, he said to us, kids, everybody into the kitchen. And I said, I'm not even allowed to go into the kitchen. You want me to go into the kitchen? So, uh, so, he, says, uh, so he says, you're going to learn to cook. I said, what for? We have a cook. He's cooked so well. I mean, you know, why bother? And so he says, well, in Canada, you won't have a cook. You better go learn how to cook and, and learn everything, including plucking chicken. I learned how to pluck chicken. Ah! And I was squeamish, but I learned how to pluck chicken. You want to eat? You do it. Hey, and I did, and I learned, and you know what? It was very helpful. So, um, my parents also learned. My sister taught me to make a bed. I went to visit her in Alexandria when she was uh, newly married, and, and she, <laughs> it was kind of cute. Uh, I get there, and she says, you know, I don't have a maid to, to, to clean up after you every, uh, every, 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 every day all the time. I share my maid with my mother-in-law, whatever. Uh, they were living in the same houses. So, so you're going to have to learn to make your bed. I said, what? <laughs> Me make my bed? It's below my stature. I mean, you know, I think it's, it's like, no. I mean, you have staff for doing this. I don't make my bed. Anyhow, I learned to make my bed in my sister's. Little did I know that she had instructions from my mother to make sure I learned how to make the bed. She had staff. But she wanted to make sure I knew how to make a bed. My mother did. And my, so she let my sister do the dirty work. <laughs> so, Question. Yes. How many staff did you have in the house? Not many. Um, we had a doorman downstairs who bowed every time we came in and so on. Even when you were a kid? Uh, before we built our building, we lived in a beautiful uh, uh, house that was three stories. Uh, and and uh, it was like we had one floor, somebody else. It was like a triplex, but it was huge. I mean, uh, the, these things were like huge. It was like a mansion, huge. And so we were on the top floor, and we had two, nanny and cook, cook cleaner. So we had, oh yeah, we had the doorman also. There was always the doorman. So there he was... He just opens the door for you? And gardening. So there was, there was... But wait, if you're on the top floor, where's yeah. your garden? Downstairs. But what about the others? We used the garden downstairs too. And the others also used... The garden was shared between us. Oh. So you had to be friends. 
You yeah. have to be friends with each oh, other. Oh yeah, everybody was friends. I mean, because you're in the garden, you're uh, sitting together. Yeah, yeah. You, 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 you had different hours and you had different. Oh, it was all done. Uh, you know, you're allowed to do this. You're not allowed to do that. That's why my parents so built the building and they said we're going to do what we want. <laughs> we had, it was like a condo, you know. You, you sort of had to be careful what you did and what you didn't do. But in in, in our building, we had the doorman. Then we had somebody in the garage to wash the car. Our car was washed twice a day. Whenever there was a bit of dust, the car would never walk out of the, get out of the garage without being spanking clean. We had, uh, again, a manservant cook, and we had a nanny. So that was, that was how, it, uh, that's how, how it worked. Now, I decided to go buy bread at age 10. And so I went to buy bread at age 10, and on the way back, I was shot. Shot? Shot. Pow? Pow. Did it get you? Yes. Where? In the lake. Fortunately. The, it was kids who were playing with a gun. They had no gun control or anything. People were able to go play with guns. They, they, had, they had a gun and they were shooting at birds. This guy's called Robin. They didn't know my name was Robin. <laughs> name of a bird, but they shot at me. They, I mean, why? Because you are. Was it wasn't because I was Jewish, or maybe it was because I was European. I don't know. Of course. I, I, I you know, I, 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 they were Arab kids. So yes. You know, maybe, and they had been watching the news and all that kind of stuff, so maybe they figured they'd get, they'd get one. I don't know. Maybe they figured it wouldn't, it wouldn't hurt me, but it did. It got, it, the, the bullet got into my leg, and fortunately I was able to get home, and, uh, and, and our manservant, loyal, went. He, they didn't know they hurt me. Our manservant went, and he got them. He was able to get them, and, and he was very. He was from Sudan, and these these people were fantastic, fantastically loyal, wonderful people. So, um, anyhow, that's not the important part. The important part is that we went to the hospital, uh, which wasn't too far from where we lived, and they looked at it and they said, "No, we're going to sew it." And the bullet is still in. My father said, but the bullet is still in. They said, well, not really. It probably went out. He said, no, there isn't a second hole. There's only one hole. Can you imagine the doctor seeing that? He says, I want an x-ray. But the technician isn't in. I'll go fetch her. He went to her home. He got her. She put on the x-ray machine. She took the x-ray, and there was the hole, the, 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 the bullet. So they operated me the next morning at 7 a.m. And, uh, and it was awful. It was really, really bad because they didn't have all kinds of medications to make you feel very good. Uh, the, the, the stuff they gave you to put you to sleep was like, made you nauseous and made you vomit and made you all kinds. It was like really bad. And the worst part was that it was infected. It was infected, which means we're gonna have to, you're going to have to come every day and get the wound cleaned, and my father would take me to the hospital every day. And um, with a driver? Hmm? With a driver? No, my parents were modern. We had two cars. We didn't share cars. They didn't have a driver, but they had two cars. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have one car with one driver because that's all my friends came to school with their driver. I wanted to go to school with my driver. No, my parents drove me to school. <laughs> You know, but to them, they were free this way. They were able to go back. My mother drove, my father drove, they went wherever they wanted. So they felt freer this way. The ones with the driver had to share the car. So, so, um, so anyhow, um, they, we went to the hospital every day, and they were afraid they might have to chop the leg off, <laughs> amputate. And for three months, we didn't know whether, whether it was going to amputate or not. And so you can imagine my poor parents having to go through all the stress 
of the building and the inheritance and the and 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 the, the whole situation, the, the stress of of the Arabs making them feel uncomfortable and unwanted and and, and so on and and their their relatives leaving one by one and there was a it was it was and to have a child who was you know like handicapped whoa. fortunately it didn't get it didn't get infected it did it, it got it got healed up. It, it healed up and fortunately by nature i'm healthy so so it was it was good i was very lucky to to to, to have surmounted that but you know for three months i was handicapped i was really i was uh, dragging my foot around and not being able to walk and all that kind of stuff